Welcome everyone. We are here together to participate in the seventh presentation in our bicentennial mini science entitled Resetting the Future. My name is Ingrid Berker and I work at the Red Path Museum located at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. McGill is located on the traditional territory of the Odnishani and the Anishinaabe nations. McGill has long recognized these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we meet, which we work, we play, we learn from each other, we exchange information, and we try to understand the environment and the land. Tonight, our speaker will be introduced by the student ambassador, Freeman Taylor. After the presentation, Freeman will also moderate the Q&A. Hello, everyone. My name is Freeman Taylor. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, distinguished James McGill Professor of Biogeoscience, Dr. Nigel Roulet. Dr. Roulet has been with McGill since 1994 and has held positions as the director for the School of Environment the director for the Global Environment and Climate Change Research Center, and most recently, he has held the position of chair of the Department of Geog Ge Geography sorry, since 2014, a position he will hold until 2024. Dr. Roulet's research has focused primarily on the interactions among hydrology, climatology, and ecosystem processes in peatlands and forested catchments of the Earth's temperate, boreal, and Arctic regions. With respect to the future of the environment, substantial scientific evidence and environmental activism has resulted in the recognition and remediation of many of the problems we have created. However, many of our problems are currently without adequate solutions. Dr. Roulet will be discussing the future of the environment as it pertains to humans, and in doing so, he will discuss potential solutions to tackle the issues plaguing our environment. While you're watching, there will be a link on screen and in the YouTube live stream description box to submit any questions you may have about the lecture. Thanks, enjoy. Thank you very much, Freeman, for the introduction. Um, and uh, welcome to everybody to the talk. When I was asked to talk on the future of the environment, I thought this would be a relatively easy talk to prepare, but then started thinking about it in more and more details. And the future of the environment is a bit of an intimidating topic to talk about. Uh, the first slide you're looking at is the, what we call the blue marble. It was the picture that NASA has put together um, of the planet Earth. It actually shows that we've incorrectly called the planet Earth. We should actually call it the planet blue, uh, given the structure of it. I was trying to figure out what I would talk about. In some of my more cynical and pessimistic moods, I thought that the talk could be represented by this slide. Uh, there are times where I feel uh, not encouraged about the environment and the future of the environment. And uh, Many of you feel maybe feel the same way in the terms of environmental anxiety. I do believe that we are in a bit of a pickle, and uh, we're going to have to figure out how to get out of this. And in the end, as you'll see when I'm talking about, I don't think that uh, we are going to resolve everything. I think we're going to have to learn how to adapt to things in the future. But I want to take you on a little bit of a journey that's going to look at uh, some of the things that we've done in the past and some of the things that we uh, should anticipate, particularly related to climate change uh, and the carbon cycle, which is an area I know a fair bit about, that uh, we may need to deal with. So many of you have followed uh, the issues with uh, climate change. It's every day we hear about it in the newspaper. It is uh, getting particular attention now because we're coming up to COP26. Uh, uh, if you believe the Prime Minister of the UK, he's going to be able to solve all the problems during the week in Glasgow. Um, uh, maybe you're a little bit more optimistic than I am about uh, his ability to be able to resolve things, but we could discuss that later if you'd like. Last summer, we really had a number of problems. Uh, we've been having problems for a long time, the fires in Australia. But these, are the, these pictures come from the fires that we saw in Western Canada. Uh, this is the town or was the town of Linton uh, that was burnt down. 
the West and particularly Manitoba saw unprecedented droughts that occurred this year with peer, um, months with no rain. Uh, Louisiana, New Orleans saw a huge amount of uh, rain with the hurricanes and particularly Ida. And this is New York City that you're seeing now with the uh, water uh, where they had the leftover of a tropical depression from Ida. And then a number of months before, Texas was completely nailed with a uh, uh, cold snap, uh, which it was totally unprepared for because of the way that the structure of the electrical supply system is done in, in, uh, in that state. Um, if we want to get an idea what the future is going to be like, how do we know this? I mean, we're, we're, we've got some models that we can predict things about the future, but some of the stuff that's dystopian literature that's been written about this doesn't paint a very nice future. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with the book or the movie and or the movie uh, on the road uh, here, uh, the postman, post-apocalyptic uh, climate situation, our own Canadian author, Margaret Atwood, the great movie uh, that looked at Soylent Green and Kim Stanley Robinson's 2140 is a, a really interesting novel about uh, New York and uh, it in uh, with uh, uh, approximately 10 to meters of additional uh, sea level rise. We can look at books and movies on utopian futures that you see. Some of you may recognize this as a utopian landscape of London. Uh, in the future, there are a number of books that have been written about a state and uh, society in California called Ecotopia. Most environmental issues are pitched in this uh, dichotomy, this environmental dichotomy of where we see the world continuing or being a pristine kind of environment, which is, I think, totally unrealistic or we see the world as being uh, a completely devastated planet uh, where uh, humanity is gonna have trouble surviving. I don't think either of those are gonna be the situation of the future. For sure, a pristine planet is not gonna be the future, but a complete dystopian future is not probably uh, in the cards, but we do have a lot of work ahead of us with environmental problems uh, that could catch up with us and could be with us for a long period of time. And I wanna kind of illustrate how that might uh, be the, the case. What are we talking about when we talk about the environment? It's one of those things that we always refer to and everybody assumes what we know what we're talking about. For someone that was director of the McGill School of Environment, which is now called the Beeler School of Environment, and has worked in environmental science my entire career, environment's actually not the easiest thing to define. So I thought for the purposes of this talk, I would actually give it a definition that I'll work with here uh, uh, that comes from the Cambridge Dictionary, the first one, where we're talking about the air, water, and land uh, in or on which uh, people, animals, and plants live. I'm not talking so much about uh, the conditions that we live in, the built environment, though that does have a tremendous influence on environmental issues that we will be talking about. I also have a more comprehensive view, and I think most people that work in environmental issues have a comprehensive view on this, because we are not just talking about the physical and biological environments, uh, but we're talking about those, the environment being situated in a uh, and related to uh, humanity, the society and the economy. Uh, this is a simple diagram over here, which illustrates the natural system, complex natural system over here. Uh, we have the hum complex humans decision uh, system with decision making, and then the economy, policies, social, that's the filter of the human interactions with the natural environment and information and, and material transport back and forth. You saw this diagram, uh, I believe the last speaker talked about this diagram, um, Andy Gonzalez, when he was talking about sustainability. It's um, from the uh, UN sustainability uh, goals. Uh, and it views the environment here as a the underpinning or the provi provisioning for the uh, um, 
support of the societies and economy and in turn the economy and society having impacts uh, on the environment. I thought what I would do though to position things is take a little step backwards to the back to the future. Um, we are dealing with this because of the bicentennial uh, environment. This mini science series was uh, developed for the uh, bicentennial. We've had many, many science series before, of which I've talked in some of them before. But I thought what we could do is we could go back and use the position of McGill's bicentennial to think about where we are at uh, and the challenges that might face us. So if we kind of look at McGill before 1800, um, the uh, Burnside uh, uh, farm uh, here with uh, Mount Royal in the background. And I've got four graphs on here, which are, if you can't see anything on the graphs, that's deliberate. Um, they're blued out because of uh, where I want to start. So in 1800, what we were dealing with is a population of somewhere around a billion people on earth, uh, probably less than a billion people on earth. The uh, contribution of uh, greenhouse gases to the atmosphere were, they were, there was definitely an effect of human activity on the atmosphere um, with land clearing. Uh, coal was being used at this point in time as the major source of energy. But in comparison to the numbers that you'll see in a minute, they don't even register on the graph. The concentrations of uh, CO2 and uh, other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are around about 280 parts per million, which is what we know from the ice cores was the concentrations of greenhouse gases at the end of, or at the uh, end of the last glaciate, major glaciation about 15,000 years ago or so, and the temperature anomalies don't even register. In fact, what we're looking at here is a temperature anomaly. If we take the temperature, the average temperature from uh, 1970 to 2000, uh, it was slightly cooler. It's about uh, um, uh, 0.2 degrees Celsius uh, cooler than the average from uh, 1970 to there. Now we go back to when the arts building was built here at McGill University around about this point in time, 1825 uh, uh, or so. Uh, the population has crept up slightly. Uh, population crept up slightly. The temperatures are about the same. We begin to see some uh, so, uh, line here on the emissions going to the atmosphere, and these are solids, which are primarily the burning of fossil fuel coal. And that has increased slightly the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, but it's not just because of burning of fossil fuels. It's also because of a tremendous amount of land clearing that was going on that was removing forests that were a sink of carbon and is now turning over carbon much quicker than the natural ecosystems did. So that does result in a net contribution of CO2 to the atmosphere. We proceed forward to 1925, which was approximately when the rotting gates were erected. This is the Burke's clock that you see over here. And now what we've done is that we've gone and we're almost up to in, in uh, 1927 or so, we've got arrived at 2 billion people on the surface of the earth, or at least that's the estimates were. What we can see is that the emissions have gone up to approximately what we would say is uh, two gigatons of carbon or, or one gigaton of carbon to the atmosphere. Uh, for those of you that are uh, interested in units, a gigaton is equivalent to 10 to the 15 grams. We see the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, CO2 is still below 300 parts per million. It's about 290 parts per million. And the equivalent with other greenhouse gases would be in the non-greenhouse gases here that are really important are methane and, and nitrous oxide uh, have just got us up to about 300 uh, parts per million equivalent. And we're still uh, cooler than, uh, significantly cooler than the, the average. Now, 
1971, uh, I picked this year deliberately, uh, partly because it was right around when this beautiful architectural uh, building on McGill Burnside Hall, which I happen to live in. I've actually never lost any visitors that have come to McGill University when they've said to me, how do I find you? I say, you go in the burn, you go in the erotic gates and you look for the ugliest building you can find and they always make it to Burnside Hall and there's no problem with that. Uh, in 1971, which was 150 years uh, since McGill, uh, the uh, 1821 start of McGill, the population now is three and a half billion people on the surface of the earth. The greenhouse gas emissions, you can see the uh, total greenhouse gas emissions are quite significant here. We're up to about 4.5 gigatons a year, which is about half of what we're emitting now to the atmosphere. Uh, it's a lot of it is in oil and in coal are about split equally here. Uh, we're starting to see gas become uh, in, important here. And this has resulted in the rise of CO2 up to about, 300 and, uh, about 320, 330 parts per million and non-greenhouse gases uh, equivalent when you add them to the CO2 is about 350. This is also the period of time when a lot of people really started thinking about uh, climate change and global change quite seriously, uh, or a few people actually did. Um, Savanti Arrhenius in, in Sweden, at the end of the 19th century had done the original calculations and it suggested that if we kept burning all our coal, we would actually substantially increase uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. And his numbers are amazingly close to what it is. We came out with the uh, reports that there were various different reports by calendar and other different people that in the 1960s and 70s, it started really talking about climate change and being quite serious about climate change. 1970 was a real turning point in thinking about environment and thinking about problems. It was the first uh, Earth Day occurred in uh, 1970. This was the picture from the New York Times, people marching. Uh, this was a poster that was prepared for uh, the uh, um, first Earth Day. But my favorite element of the first uh, Earth Day was this cartoon by the famous philosopher Pogo, which basically says we have met the enemy and the enemy is us, when he was talking about environmental degradation. And this was uh, put together for the Earth Day and uh, published on Earth Day. In 1971, I was in high school, uh, was reading about a lot of environmental problems and uh, what is what really motivated me to go in and uh, study the environment. I also did a lot of reading at that point in time as I think many people that are on this would have uh, this call, um, many science series would have read. And Silent Spring was the book that really generated a, a lot of interest in the environment. Uh, partly because Rachel Carson is a really brilliant author to read, but it also, uh, the idea of the songbirds uh, dying because of uh, DDT and pesticides that we were uh, applying quite liberally, the eggs that were on eagles uh, uh, were too soft for the eagles to um, reproduce effectively. And her book and the battles with the chemical industry uh, the misinformation that was associated with the things, the uh, actual attacks that uh, that uh, Carson experienced, uh, were a kind of a bellwether of what was to come over the next uh, 50 years uh, when we dealt with environmental issues. Uh, there was a long time in coming in legislation. Uh, DDT in Canada was really significantly reduced after 1972, and it was deregistered. Uh, in 1985, uh, but it took a long time for protocols globally to come around and the Stockholm Convention on, uh, on uh, uh, persistent organic pollutants was really in, um, came about uh, um, in uh, only in the last 20 years or so is when we saw that uh, come about. That was a significant step. 
when I was in first year or second year university uh, and I was taking my first course uh, in, well, I've taken a number of courses in limnology, but I, uh, in ecology, but I took limnology, which was a course which actually uh, really got me interested in the interaction between physical systems, chemical systems, and biological systems. The issue of eutrophication was a really, really hot issue. I've got a slide here in Lake Erie, which you see down here, and this is from 2011, which are, where these are the algal blooms, the cyanobacteria that you see on here in, in, uh, in uh, Lake Erie. Uh, eutrophication was created or is caused by the additional nutrients of phosphorus and nitrogen put into lakes. Uh, when I was in university, we talked about Lake Erie as being a dead lake, but well, that was actually a misnomer or an incorrect, it was actually too alive. It produced too much primary productivity in algae, and that algae would uh, go to the bottom of the lake, and when the lake covered over with ice in the winter, the biological oxygen demand was so high that it actually made the lake very unfavorable for fish, and that's why the lake was considered to be a dead lake because of uh, the fish. The uh, there were a number of experiments that were done in the Canadian Experimental Lakes area, uh, which was really uh, Dave Schindler's um, efforts that they did these tremendous experiments where they put uh, curtains across the lake and they put phosphorus in one side of the lake, nitrogen in the other side of the lake. And this was on the cover of Science. And it was kind of the definitive example of the effect of nutrients and phosphorus causing uh, eutrophication. There are other places where nitrogen causes eutrophication. And Lake Erie, as a result of those things, and there are lots of pictures that I could find on this, but I got from the Lake Erie report. We're looking at here is the total loading of phosphorus into Lake Erie from 1967 to 2007. What you see here is the green is non-point source pollution, which comes from agricultural areas. Uh, and uh, that don't go through uh, treatment plants. And there's still a significant amount of phosphorus that goes in and it points out one of the problems of what you do, how do you deal with uh, nutrients and pollutants that come from diffuse sources. The core concentrated sources or point sources here, which are for, uh, dealt with now with sewage treatment plants have dropped substantially over time uh, with the investment uh, in these various things. We've put so much phosphorus on the landscape, and as Elena Bennett, one of our profs would say, we've, we've got this legacy now uh, where there's hundreds of years of phosphorus stored in soils that could end up coming back to haunt us down the road. The other issue that was really prominent a little bit later when I was actually a young university prof and worked on issues of nitrate and uh, sulfur deposition, which was acid rain, uh, who would have thought that we would be having these two fellows championing environmental uh, issues, but they actually were some of the most progressive uh, leaders in terms of environmental uh, compared to what we have uh, these days, um, which was the development of the Clean Water and the Clean Air Act uh, um, that led to substantive reductions in sulfate emissions. And you can see in the blue, these are the sulfate reduction of sulfate emissions from 1990 to 2015 in North America. The red is the drop in sulfate emissions in Europe. And that's happened a lot because of the collapse of the Iron Curtain and the industries in, in Eastern Germany and behind the Iron Curtain that produced an awful lot of sulfate. And the transmissions, the legislations that required people to actually capture sulfate. But, we see here a rise, a significant rise of sulfate in East Asia. Uh, and so there's uh, really high concentrations of sulfate in, in China and places like India. And China recently, if you've been reading the newspapers, is trying to deal with this quite significantly because of the health problems it does with urban pollution. Um, but there, the legislation actually resulted with uh, significant drops. The other one that we've had significant advances on that have happened is the uh, uh, ozone and the chlorofluorocarbons in the atmosphere and the pr uh, production of the ozone hole. This is the appearance of the South Polar Ozone Hole that you see going from 2002 through to 
2017. And the Montreal Protocol that was developed uh, resu has resulted in uh, substantive reduction and of the use of uh, CFCs. And this is the reduction in the concentration of CO CFCs that we've seen over the last decade or so. And these are the long-term concentrations of the CFCs. The scale is over here that you can see, and they're turning around and they're decreasing in the atmosphere, which means that we, the ozone hole and ozone tropospheric or stratospheric ozone, concentrations are improving. So these are real, real successes. Um, we're not out of the woods with them completely yet, but, but the cause and effects of these problems were relatively easy to identify, or at least appeared to be relatively easy to identify, and we were able to move forward. Each one of these problems had some connection to human in the sense that there were uh, cause uh, the uh, cause concerns for humans or negative consequences for humans. So humans, for example, were really, uh, people were really concerned about the ozone hole because it was related to ultraviolet radiation and people associated the word cancer with those things. And I think that was a motivating factor. Uh, with uh, eutrophication, you saw the, uh, the um, algal blooms that were real problems for people. And we still have the same issues that rise in many of our lakes in the Eastern townships here. Uh, the issue of acid rain, people saw the lakes and fish were uh, dropping on the lakes that the people had their, their cottages on. And I think people were scared about these issues. There were also rel fairly simple problems compared to some of the problems we've got now. They, and I mean, they're relatively simple. I don't want to say they're simple problems, relatively simple comparatively. In a lot of cases, we were able to identify the sources of where the problem came from. For example, acid rain was largely due to coal fire generating systems or smelters. And uh, we were able to do that with the uh, ozone and the CFCs. We had alternatives all ready to go. It was one company was really responsible for most of them and they were able to um, loosen up patent instructions. So these problems were relatively, I don't want to stay straightforward, but we could deal with them. If you go on the web and you type in now the, uh, the big environmental problems or what are the top 10 environmental problems, you'll get a list of these things. And the common agreement that comes on these is air and water pollution. Um, air pollution is a serious problem in urban environments now. Uh, it uh, is creating uh, a lot of fatalities that happen in, in uh, pollution. Biodiversity and conservation issues, and you heard an awful lot about that from Andy Gonzalez a month ago. Uh, land use change and uh, uh, food and water insecurity. Uh, Graham McDonald talked about that three, uh, two, two, a month, two months ago, I guess it was. I'm going to focus on climate change because it's the issue I know most about. Uh, 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 ocean acidification is associated with some of the same problems related to climate change with the CO2 that's going into the atmosphere. Plastics is an issue that's, that uh, people have heard an awful lot about. And the interesting thing about plastics is it's actually showing up in the in sediments and people are identifying as one of the markers for the Anthropocene, which is the uh, influence that we're having. And ozone, acid rain, and eutrophication are still on this list and still could come back to be a problem and, and where they occur in developing countries uh, and issues like that. So we're not uh, completely out of the woods with those issues. So why are some of these problems, particularly climate change and the biodiversity issue, uh, maybe uh, urban pollution, water pollution, well, why are the problems a little bit different? Well. These are what we call complex problems. They're complex systems that involve multiple interactions and lots of feedbacks. And I think on the climate issues, you've heard all about feedbacks with the sea ice, uh, the clouds um, um, issue that we see. The cause and effects in these types of systems are not straightforward. Uh, they are multiple. Uh, the solutions are not easy and are not clear, and they have to be multifaceted. And uncertainty is an inherent problem that comes with these problems. It's much higher than a lot of the other problems that we've worked on and that we're comfortable with in the way that we do things. I've always argued that we have a view 
of how we handle problems in science, which kind of comes from and is embedded in a 19th century view of physics uh, that we look at things where we think things should follow law-like uh, uh, law uh, relationships. And in the systems that we work with, there are much more tendencies of convergence and divergence across various different things that go on, uh, and they're difficult to figure out. The uh, resolving them will require new approaches. They're what we call wicked problems because of the complexity that we're dealing with. The question is whether our governance structures, our economics, and our society, the way we operate, are uh, really uh, all that well-tuned for being able to uh, solve these problems. I think all you need to do is look at the last Canadian election. Environment was really, really on the agenda of people uh, that were, were vote, uh, looking for your votes. But I didn't actually hear a lot of really concrete solutions. I heard a lot of promises about we, how we do these things, but I'm not really sure that we know how to do this. An economic system that actually has does not have environment embedded in it seems to me to be a problem, uh, seems to be a significant problem. If we think of the environment and we think of what the environment does for us is essentially free goods or a place where we can dump all our wastes, I think that presents some serious problems. The other thing is that these are many generation problems, and I will illustrate that in a few minutes on the CO2 question. Uh, some of the impacts are immediate, and we're actually seeing some of those impacts now. Certainly, the impacts with air pollution are really immediate. The impacts for climate change, we've been talking about them for quite a while, but they now are definitely happening. Um, people are observing these types of things. Uh, but the problem is very long term in the sense that if we start right now uh, dealing with this problem, uh, it's going to be still around for a very, very long period of time. This presents the problem that the benefits of, of us acting now will not be reaped by us, but will be reaped by future generations. And this whole idea of intergenerational rights and what we're doing, leaving the environment better than it was, than we inherited it for the next generations, doesn't seem to be something that is too instilled in the way that we think. It's coming more and more, but uh, you know, I'm not sure that it's embedded in the way we think. The other thing, too, is that in the large cases of uh, global change, individual and collective actors are very, very important. One of the things that is interesting, and it was very instructive here when we went through the divestment uh, debate at McGill, is, you know, I, my personal opinion is McGill should, be, should divest. Uh, but I also think that each individual here is we have to sit down and we have to look at our own environmental footprints. It doesn't matter if we actually get a lot of the big corporations to turn things around a bit. The reason uh, a lot of the emissions happen in terms of greenhouse gases are diffused from the millions of cars that we drive around. Okay, we can move to electrical cars, but we still heat our houses, all these various different things. So we have a huge footprint on the environment, which is collectively from our individual actions and uh, so I think it needs a combination of that kind of approach. I don't think we can get away with blaming the bad guys all the time. So where are we at now? If we look at the present situation, well, this is, and I think Andy may have shown actually one of these diagrams too. I call this the every, everything up diagram that I show in my introductory courses. Uh, this is from the Anthropocene Review, uh, review uh, Stefan's diagrams where he's, put together uh, this data on things like urban po population, urban population, uh, GDP, uh, the damming of things, water use, transportation, telecommunications, they're all exponentially increasing. And the earth source and trends, so these are kind of some of the drivers of change. And if we look at these things, these are the response of the system to those changes. So there's a CO2 increase, nitrous oxide, methane increase here, stratospheric ozone, the surface temperature, ocean acidification, we can just keep going through. Nitrogen in the coastal zones is a re re resulting in these large hypoxia event. So that happened. Tropical forest loss, it was in the newspaper today about the uh, things that are going on in Brazil with this bio biospheric uh, degradation, the rise of domestic land. All these things are going up. They're all increasing, which are increasing pressure 
on uh, the planetary system. And in fact, early we thought about the carrying capacity of Earth, and now we think about the idea of planetary boundaries. These are fuzzy boundaries about what could the Earth sustain in terms of the various different changes. And if we go around the outside of this wheel, uh, this was put together by Stefan. Um, actually, uh, there was, I think, uh, one or two McGill professors on this paper also. Uh, we look here at biospheric integrity, uh, climate change, uh, stratospheric ozone, aerosols, acidification, phosphorus and nitrogen, which are related to freshwater use and land use change. If it's in the red, we've exceeded the planetary boundary system, or at least the best the calculations suggest that. If it's yellow, we're in uh, a very cautious period where there's a high amount of uncertainty and the system could flip in either direction. And that's where climate changes and land use changes in this. And if we're in the green, we're in the zone where we're actually within the planetary boundaries and we haven't exceeded that uh, kind of capacity. And stratospheric ozone, we're still okay here and we probably caught it in time to be able to do this. But these boundaries is a kind of way to think about the system. Now, the boundaries do move with technology um, if we do improvements, so you can bring things back within the systems. But it's a general notion of thinking about things that we are really exceeding the capacity of the Earth to be able to support the billions of people on Earth right now and basically support the billions of people on Earth with the consumption habits we have, the growth in the middle class, and all these various different things that go along with it. So if we think about McGill's next 100 years, I have no idea what it'll look like. I kind of think the arts building still might be there. Uh, in 2021, which will be the, uh, the um, tricentennial of McGill, we can look out here at 2021, the estimates for population, the high scenario, we'd have about 16 billion. The medium scenario is we'd have about 11 and the low scenario is we'd have about, uh, we'd have about uh, eight, uh, billion people. Most people now think it's going to be somewhere in this zone here around about a 10 or 11 billion. And the reason is because of a thing we call the demographic shift is people get better off. Uh, reproductive rates uh, decrease as people become more educated, particularly um, women that get into the workforce and participate in the workforce. They decrease in uh, population growth, which would be a good thing. If we look at the projections of fossil fuel emissions uh, that we're expecting, these are guesses that are built on various different economic scenarios and societal scenarios for the future that are done by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The red is the worst scenario that the, they have done and the uh, blue here or a purplish thing is, the, is an over-optimistic scenario that we have here. These give you an idea of the concentration that would be experiencing by 2100. So we're up here about 900 parts per million with this scenario, which is called the uh, representative uh, scenario 8.5. Um, this is six, uh, this is 4.5 and two. The trajectory we're on now in terms of our emissions are following more along this scenario and above this scenario than they are anywhere near these scenarios. These scenarios are kind of what we would need if we were to obtain, obtain the Paris Agreement. What are the consequences for climate change if we put these scenarios in the climate models? These are the various different runs, the 39 models here, 32 models here. This would be at the 2100, the uh, temperature would be somewhere about 0.5 degrees above uh, what it was uh, historically. Um, we are way beyond that. This is the trajectory where we'd be about four degrees higher um, with this kind of scenario here. And we've been talking a lot about the 1.5 degrees, which I'll talk about in a minute, which comes from the Paris Accord. But what would this look like in real terms? And I not, don't want to go through the litany of environmental impacts that would happen with the various different scenarios of climate change. I thought the one that would drive home most people to most people is sea level rise. And sea level rise now, we, the, in the uh, at reports, we really underestimated this. Uh, the sea level rise in that red scenario is going to be somewhere around about 0.8 meters by the uh, 2100. We look at those. 
What does that mean? Well, these are a few maps that some of you may recognize the places. Vancouver, uh, the red area that is, is the area that would be inundated by uh, 2100 with uh, uh, 0 0.6 to 0.8 meter rise in sea level here. It would be inundated uh, by storm surges and various things of this. Those of you that uh, know much about this is uh, the lowland areas in Europe here and in England that you see vast areas of the Netherlands and Belgium uh, and Germany and Bangladesh here. And I put Bangladesh in here because these areas here, there's an awful lot of population in these areas here, but they're in countries that really have the ability to possibly adapt and move people around. But countries that are less fortunate than us and do not have the wealth that we have, have much less ability to be able to adapt. And the estimate in some papers uh, is that a low estimate is that there's 190 million people to over half a billion people that will be severely affected by sea level rise and will have to find some relocation as a result of sea level rise in this order of uh, one meter. That's a very practical example of uh, changes. So, We've agreed, the nations have agreed, that 1.5 degrees C is uh, uh, an objective that we would like to meet uh, by 2050. Uh, I am very pessimistic about us reaching this. Uh, I don't think we have a hope in hell of doing it. But we can look at what's required to be able to do this if we uh, do these. So these are the temperature kind of ranges that we're dealing with here when we figure out, so the idea is you take the models, you figure out the temperature that you want, and you kind of run them backwards and say, what is it that we need to do with greenhouse gas emissions, land use change to be able to obtain those sorts of things. And these are the trajectories here, if we're looking at starting at 2010, which is where the emissions are right now of CO2, and these are a bunch of scenarios that we would need to follow within the blue area here to be able to get us to this 1.5 degree target increase. We're not there yet, we're about uh, 0.9 degrees C, but by 2050 to limit to 1.5 degrees. Now, why do people talk about 1.5 degrees or two if you think about it is because there's some suggestions that that's where we would start moving into dangerous climate change, where we would have uh, severe re repercussions to the climate system. Um, I think we may be already on our way there right now, but the things, this is like thermal hailing circulation and the redistribution of heat to the north are uh, really big problems. But if you look over here, for us to follow these trajectories, and there's there, the United Nations, the IPCC produced a bunch of different scenarios on this, all of them require a 90% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2050. Uh, there needs to be an increase of at least 60% or more of primary energy from electricity and 70% reductions of, uh, from coal, oil, and gas. So that means it's, this electricity can't come from coal-fired generating systems. It has to come from hydroelectricity, uh, alternate energies that go on. They've also in within this, the own, uh, within these scenarios, they've got about 150% increase in nuclear power production, huge increases in biofuel use and carbon capture, which are just coming online now. And we have real questions about how these can be scaled and very large reductions in emissions from agricultural activities, uh, particularly methane and nitrous oxide uh, to reduce those. So th this is what we have to do to be able to get on these trajectories here. So we are putting in quite a bit of alternate energy now. Uh, it is increasing, and I think it's increasing a lot faster than what people thought it would be. And it is actually proving to be more economical than I think a lot of people uh, would have argued about with wind power and solar. But the problem with wind power and solar is you have intermittency. So you have to back those things up with uh, hydroelectric power that you can turn off and on very quickly. Nuclear power, you cannot turn on and off very quickly. Carbon capture is just starting now. This is in Iceland. You capture the carbon and you put it in basalt in the permanent reservoir. Carbon capture by trees and growing trees, that's a possibility, but that's a land intensive. 
And biofuels, which a lot of people say is the panacea, I think the jury's really out on biofuels right now. I deliberately put this in as a corn crop because a lot of people aren't convinced that corn is actually a great biofuel. There are many, many papers that you can look at and documents that chart out courses about how we could reduce our energy demand and put them onto other things in the future. They chart out what we need to do. So we need to bring in, this is the distribution of energy. This would be, for example, wind power, offshore wind power, solar that we need to bring online. Catherine Potvan and her really innovative group who brought out Re-Energizing Canada. These are all roadmaps though, about how one would get there. They're about possibilities that we could do to get there. The question is the political will and the economic structures and the societal desire to move us in that direction. Why this is absolutely critical to do is that we need to look at the carbon balance and go back to the carbon balance. This is the carbon balance that was produced in the most recent uh, report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The black lines that you see on here and the black numbers that you see on here are the natural carbon cycle that's going on. The red lines are where humans have altered those carbon cycle to result in increasing the concentration, the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere and the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. That's how the concentration of CO2 has gone up. And that's largely happened because we've taken fossil fuel reserves and changed land and we've put it into the atmosphere. Some of that carbon goes back into the oceans and some of that carbon goes back into land. But the land, the oceans, and the atmosphere are coupled in what we call the fast carbon cycle that will equilibrate over decades to centuries that will equilibrate. This number here, which is about 10 petagrams per year right now that we're doing, the only actual removal of carbon out of the system is to get it out of this fast cycle is through the geologic cycle to get it into the sediments on the bottom of the ocean. This piddly little number here, which is 0.2 gigatons, is what that removal rate is. So the imbalance between this 10 and that 0.2 year in and year out is what is causing putting more carbon into this part of the system here. And it will persist in this system and only will be removed at a very slow rate out here. Burial is actually trying to increase this. That's what that's trying to do is to increase that. So if we look at a graph here of what's happening and what, where the carbon that we put into the atmosphere ends up, these are the two sources of carbon. This is fossil fuel emissions here, land use change. And land use change is not insignificant. Land use change is about 10% of the total carbon CO2 that's in the atmosphere now and other greenhouse gases. And it used to be up until 1850, uh, 1900, it used to actually dominate it. These are the sources of the fossil fuels and also cement uh, up here. And then these negatives are the partitioning of where that CO2 is ending up. The blue that you see on here is the atmospheric growth and we measure that quite well. We know what's going on. This dark blue is the amount of carbon that we put in the atmosphere that's arriving and going into the oceans. So the oceans are taking up about 25% of the CO2 that we're putting in the atmosphere. By residual, we know in some models, we know the land is taking up about 25% of that and 50% is ending up in the atmosphere and that's what's causing, or remaining in the atmosphere and that's what's causing the CO2 increase. So without the oceans and without the terrestrial biosphere, we'd be in a lot worse shape than we're in now. The issue about that time and that slow spigot at the bottom of the ocean is really where the bugaboo comes into this system. This is a paper by Archer that was in 2009. There've been some updates of this, but you don't really need to pay attention to the numbers except for along here. This goes from zero to a thousand years and this goes out to 10,000 years. These are the reductions of the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere over time. This is for a pulse of five, uh, 1,000 petagrams of the atmosphere. Why do we pick 1,000? Because we've put already 500 in the atmosphere. And this is if you put 5,000 in the atmosphere, which is probably not likely to do this. What you see is if we turn that single pulse and we now see how long it resides in the atmosphere, that drives the CO2 up to 700. 
But even a thousand years after that, it's still sitting up at over 400 parts per million. That is the imbalance between the fossil fuel carbon cycle and the fast carbon cycle that we actually live in and that all the organisms on the surface of the earth live in. This is the crux of the problem and this is why it's intergenerational and it's gonna take such a long time to resolve this. So John Holden, who's from uh, Harvard a number of years ago said that we need to mitigate, we need to adapt or suffer. And we're probably gonna have to deal with the mix of all these uh, in, in the future. Mitigation, we haven't been great at it. Adaptation requires resilience and, and the resources to be able to do this. And I do think there's gonna be a fair bit of suffering that goes on. Are we capable of doing this? Well, I think we need to address consumption and patterns of consumption. Energy is really associated with our well-being, and energy right now is dominated by fossil fuels, and we need to find alternate sources of energy, but we also need to reduce our consumption of energy and decouple as much as possible this notion of energy and well-being. We need to think in complex systems. We, we avoid this, but complexity is the reality. We need to deal with the uncertainty that comes with complexity. If you want 100% proof, it doesn't exist. It's never existed in science, that kind of proof, but we need to be able to deal with these things and deal contingencies and scenarios in here with the deal with the uncertainty. We need to see environment, rather than it being separate entity, we need to see it as an integral part of our social, cultural, and political economics. If we look at McGill, we have an environment program. We teach environment courses. Why aren't they integral in part of sociology, culture, politics, economics? If they're getting that way, we should be able to abolish environment some down the road, environment programs, and actually have them embedded in all our learning systems. Solutions that we need to do, we need to be ethical, fair, just, and embody equity. We cannot we are responsible for so much to the emissions in the atmosphere for the Western world. We cannot lay this burden on others that are in the developing world. We need to act. And I think we need to all act individually. We need to act locally, lo uh, locally uh, provincially, and at the national level. And that will collectively result in uh, global action. And we need to maintain and sustain hope. Now, you may say this is pretty funny saying this after the talk I've gone through. I am hopeful that we'll be able to address this. I recognize environmental anxiety. In fact, that was in an article in today's Guardian was on uh, environmental anxiety. But I think we really need to uh, maintain our hope. Am I optimistic? Uh, not so much. Um, Albert Einstein says we can't solve our problems with the same thinking we use to create them. And that's very much the way that we're doing it right now. We need to think about these different ways. Um, and I want to finish the talk with one of Kim and Stan Lyra Robinson's new books. It's about to come out in uh, October 21st. It'll come out in paperback. Uh, but it's been out for about a year, The Ministry for the Future. I have it on my iPad that I'm reading it right now. This is not an uplifting book. Uh, it talks about the possible futures that would happen. The Ministry for the Future is a ministry that was created in the United Nations to be able to think about future problems and how we might uh, deal with them. And so I hope that gives you a glimpse of what I think the future in the environment may hold for us. And I would like people to be, or societies and things to prove me that this is a pessimistic view and we're gonna actually do much better than uh, what I've laid out here. I did not wanna sugarcoat it because I think people should realize the problem that we're faced with, but I do believe it's in human capacity to deal with this problem, but we need to get moving on it quickly. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Nigel. This is Ingrid. I'm, I'm grateful that we heard so much in such a short period of time, and I officially get to gift you, but we do have time to take a few questions. Freeman, were there any questions? 
Yes, we have a few questions. The first is, do you think the future of the environment is sustainable without too much risk to the economy? Well, that, that's interesting. And a question would be, what, what is meant by risk to the economy? If what we mean is that we need to have material growth uh, for the economy to and continue to grow, and that is done through consumer goods, it's done by using more resources, uh, primary resources, it's done on the backs of energy consumption that is dominated by fossil fuels and not alternatives, then um, I think that uh, there is a discontinuity that exists there. However, the fact is that we could switch to alternate ways to think about the ways that we think more about human well-being. We think about the livelihoods that people have, the, the satisfaction they have with their, their, their life environments. If we require everybody to have a, uh, on earth to have a single family home, we require them to have all their cottages up in the Laurentians and the Muskoka, we require, and everybody wants to go from Montreal, for example, down the Caribbean every single year, all these types of things, we just can't do it with uh, eight to nine billion people on earth. But we could be really innovative in the way that we think about how to do these things. I don't see there's any reason why people's well-being could not be significantly improved. But if we are talking about material possessions and material growth, I think that is a, a, an issue. And that's why I said that I think at the crux of the problem is decoupling this idea of economic growth, materialism, consumption, uh, and wealth from the notion of well-being and, and human well-being and, and uh, uh, I think that's a critical issue that we need to think about. I'm not an economist, so um, I'll leave that to the economists to solve that. Well, actually, I don't think we should leave it to the economists to solve it. I think we need to all think about this. All right, great answer. Um, another question here is, it says, how effective are carbon capture devices as compared to nature-based solutions like reforesting? Okay, well, there, there's a huge amount in the literature on this. Uh, recently, there's been three or four papers that have gone back and forth about how much uh, we could do with reforestation and carbon capture using forests to be able to take it up. The numbers vary all over the place. So we're, we're somewhere around about 500 uh, petagrams or gigatons of carbon that we're emitting, we've emitted to the atmosphere uh, since the Industrial Revolution. And uh, the, the largest estimates I've seen for the capacity of uh, forests and reforestation to take up carbon would be about 200 petagrams, or that would be about 40% of that is, uh, could be taken up uh, uh, by forests. Uh, but there are people that argue that those are gross overestimates that happen because they rely on appropriate climates. The you know, vegetation requires the moisture, the water to be able to, uh, to, be able to grow like that. So there's a lot of uh, numbers that are, are there. Carbon capture right now is really in the test phase. It's really not, um, uh, it's, it's not a, uh, a solution at the present time in the sense that it's got to be proven to be scalable. It's got to be proven to be able to, to do this. It, it is working well in, in Iceland and it could work well, for example, in New Zealand that have the right rocks to be able to bury the carbon. There may be alternate ways of burying carbon and collecting that carbon, but can we scale that? There are an awful lot of carbon capture technologies that work quite well uh, but the question is about scalability on this. And I know that uh, Ty said here at McGill and uh, Ecole Polytechnique are working a fair bit on these types of issues and carbon capture, but that's, that's the real question about whether we, they are scalable. Okay, we've got another question here. Everything is always too complex. How do you deal with the complexity of systems reform and climate change solutions? Okay, so everything's complex because it is complex. And what I mean by complexity, uh, th th it's not to be uh, confused with complicated. I mean, it is complicated, but complexity is talks about the behavior of the interactions and, this, and the feedbacks that happen. And, and, I'm, and I think, you know, I, 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 
complexity is not a reason for running away from these things. Uh, Andy Gonzalez talked about it last time, uh, and Andrew or um, Graham talked about it in his talk. Complexity is a fact of these systems. It deals with these systems. It presents the problems that makes the solutions that we, we can no longer treat these as linear systems. They're nonlinear systems. And so we have to accept that. And if we don't accept that, we're just going to continue perpetuating the problems the way they are. We're going to piecemeal the solutions. That's what I mean about seeing the systems. I teach a course on, on, on systems thinking, which is to get people to think about the feedbacks and what happens. Delays, as we're doing with uh, reducing CO2, have profound impacts down the road in these kinds of systems that have. So we have to, rather than run away from these systems, we have to think about them and we have to deal uh, with ways of being able to be comfortable with that complexity, to be comfortable with the uncertainty that complexity gives us, and then need to be able to move forward in our decision-making processes with that complexity in mind. And how we do that is that we deal it with various different scenarios for the future, we build contingencies in, and what we should be doing is maximizing the resilience of our systems as, a pi as opposed to minimizing the resilience of our systems. Uh, so by going to single crops, mono crops, all these types of things, we make ourselves much more susceptible to climate variability and climate change. Reducing biodiversity is a significant problem on the, uh, that we have in the future. So our urban systems, we should be, build, we should be building resilience in our urban systems as opposed to uh, diminishing um, uh, resilience in our systems. Um, you know, that's why when we have problems like the ice storm and the system collapses, it's because we haven't built resilience in the system. We have, in hindsight, built resilience in that, into that system. Texas did not have resilience in the system because of an extremely bizarre economic structure for its energy that it's had there. And that was why it had that catastrophe that happened. So we need to build these capacities in and we need to think about them as opposed to thinking that the way that we dealt with things before, it's going to be an appropriate way to deal with these wicked problems. I think Ingrid wants to respond, but she's muted. Oh, okay. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Nigel. Thanks, Freeman. Thanks, Stuart, in the background. We do have gifts for our speaker. Some of them have built in a little bit of resilience to them. One of your gifts is this little notepad that I made from lots of scrap paper that I pulled out of the blue bin at, at the university and um, took it to get bound up with a little bit of red McGill. You'll get a notepad. You will get a McGill outreach face mask, something resilient to use to overcome whatever is happening around McGill. You do need to wear masks indoors inside every building. Doesn't matter whether it's well ventilated or not. For your appreciation of the earth, the treasures from the earth is a book we published about the mineral collections. Well, all the minerals on exhibit. I hope you can enjoy a little bit of the treasures of the earth without the museum is closed. Uh, we're not sure when it will be open again, but while it's closed, here's something for Nigel to share and enjoy. Also at the museum is a skeleton of a Gorgosaurus, a dinosaur that went extinct. Environmental stress for sure is what affected this poor guy. This is a stereoscopic viewer, it'll, Open it once you take it out of the packaging, it'll open up and you can get a view of an animal that lived 65 million years ago. And for your outdoor enjoyment, I don't hope do you have this one, uh, Nigel? Leafy. I Lynn. do, but I I have lots of people I could share it with. Great. These are coming your way. Thanks again. What uh what a lot of insight. I wish we could have kept going, but we really do have to honor our our hour together. We're going to get together again in a month from now. The eighth um, presentation in this series, the Bicentennial Mini Science on Resetting the Future, is on November 11th, 6 o'clock, same place, McGill YouTube. The Future of Humanity and Global Governance. The speaker is Dr. Jennifer Welsh, 
She's in McGill's political science department. Have a great month, a wonderful weekend of thanks. Enjoy the weather we're having in, in this part of the world while it lasts. And we'll see you in about four weeks time. Thanks everyone.